I want to show you today how the journey from the Earth to the Moon can make liturgy better. Or perhaps a better title for this would be A Failure of Imagination. But to understand either one of those, we have to take a journey ourselves. So here we go. Have you ever noticed that when you come out of Mass and people are headed to their car and they're talking, what they tend to be talking about is the homily or the music. The music and the preaching captivate our minds, which is curious to me because I could pretty much convince you that music and preaching are two of the least important things that just happened at Mass. In the Eucharist, Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the source and summit of our faith. In the readings, the Word of God laid out, the living Word spoken to our hearts as we sit in the body of Christ. So rich, and yet so many people decide when to go to church or even if to go based on kind of a well, I don't know. I didn't really like the music. Now that I'm poking fun of, but the truth is we need to understand that. And I can explain it to you. You know, music and preaching are two of the primary affective elements of the liturgy. Let me read a sentence to you. Every sentence has its specific affective quality, though by reason of the poverty of language has no name. Think what this means. It means music evokes a sensation in us that there are no words to describe. Music says things that words alone cannot. We could just say the Gloria every Sunday at Mass. I'm sure you've said it before. It goes kind of like this. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. But that is not the same thing as singing. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, heavenly King. That said things that words alone cannot say. And so we want to talk about music for a moment. And it's a pretty big topic in the church today. Some people are saying what we need to be doing is singing the big worship songs that they're singing at the mega church down the street. Good, good father and oceans. They're on the Christian radio. And there's others who are saying we need to not sing any songs. We need to go back and chant the mass in Latin as we once did. But I would submit to you that if you're asking, should we be chanting in Latin or singing oceans? You're asking the wrong question. That's the wrong question. The question we should be asking is, are we bringing the very best of who we are to the most important thing that we do? And the difference is that that is a qualitative question, and it makes all the difference. I'll show you a chart that has guided me throughout my liturgy life. It says, great liturgy done well is transcendent. Poor liturgy done well is inspiring. Great liturgy done badly is tolerable. Poor liturgy done badly is demoralizing. I love this chart. The more you sit with it, the more truth you'll see in it. But let's take a look at the top half for a second. I love those two lines. Great liturgy done well is transcendent. Poor liturgy done well is inspiring. There's an element to that that says it doesn't really matter what you call good or bad liturgy. If we do it with the utmost of competence, with sensitivity to the liturgy and power and reverence, the worst you can be is inspiring. That's the worst case. You know, I graduated from a place called St. Meinrad. It's a school of theology and a seminary. But more importantly, there's, a, there's 80 monks who every day, faithfully, five times a day, chant the liturgy of the hours and the mass. It's transcendent. It moves me. I didn't go to school there by accident. I didn't pick a school and say, oh, look, they have monks. You know, I actually chose the school because I wanted to pray with them and I wanted to learn how they do what they do. And if a monk from St. Minard was standing here, I know what he would say to you. He would say, if you don't understand what chant brings to liturgy, you just haven't heard it done the way it's intended to be done. You've been singing it all these years. Don't sing it. Chant is sung speech. That's what they say. Sung speech meaning speech with notes attached. You go at the speed of speech, which is faster than you think, with the inflection of speech, like the commas and the periods. And so often at Mass, I'll do this for you, and I'm only barely exaggerating. We go, holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts. The, the monks would be way ahead of you, all right? They're 
Holy, holy, holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. If you think chant can't move a modern heart, then you have not heard it done the way it's intended to be done. But if you don't think a modern song can be powerful and reverent and at home in the liturgy, you just haven't heard it done the way it's intended to be done. I was in a crowd of 2 million people in South America when we began Eucharistic adoration and the Holy Father placed the Eucharist in the monstrance and, nailed bef- and knelt before it as we did. And one guy in a guitar came out and began to play. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. And you did not have to understand English that day to understand the song of our heart that was being sung. You know, my dad used to say to me, if your only tool's a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. That is very good wisdom and especially appropriate in the liturgy. You know, if you think the way to finally get through to those hardened confirmation students and their very cynical parents who don't come to church anymore is to chant antiphons in Latin on their retreat, or if you think the way to get the enthusiasm you hope for at 8 a.m. Sunday Mass is to turn up your electric guitar to 11, you know, I'm here to tell you, you've only got a hammer and every problem is looking more and more like a nail to you. Physicians have a creed. The physician's creed is, first off, do no harm. I personally think that would make an excellent liturgical musician's creed, right? It's already a miracle. There's going to be a miracle right here in this place. So if something I'm going to do is going to muddle that up, just don't do anything. My first role as a musician at liturgy is not to distract, not to distract from an encounter, because that's what particularly the Eucharistic liturgy is, right? An encounter with the holy. And if I've managed to do that, if I've managed to not distract, you know, perhaps then I can make a choice, sing a song that helps to facilitate that encounter. And that's really the goal of a parish music group. Our goal should never be strictly musical. We're there for a missionary purpose, to facilitate encounter. And the thing is, a parish is a very diverse place. We are not a monastery or a convent. There's those ladies on the front row with their rosaries in hand, and they've been here for 45 minutes, and there's a bunch of guys with their arms crossed out there that are saying, Lord, if you're there, would you please just show me? And the truth is, there are moments where the gravitas of liturgy, the power of what we do, calls for a beautiful chant or a traditional hymn. There's still moments where we just need to kneel down after communion and say, Lord, I need you. Or leave this place with a little victory in our heart, singing a song with melody and words that are familiar to my modern ear. You know, the Roman rite is 461 years old. We codified the Latin mass almost 500 years ago, but the church is 2000 years old. We were singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs for centuries before we chanted a word in Latin. And when Latin was introduced into the liturgy, it's because St. Jerome translated the scriptures into Latin the Latin Vulgate Bible, Vulgate from the same root word as vernacular. He didn't do it for artistic value. He did it because he wanted the scriptures to be in a language more people could understand. And if you're listening to this thinking, this is so interesting, but I don't make any of these decisions at my parish. I have no authority. I think it's super important that you know these things. In fact, I've become convinced that until the body of Christ understands these things, they just don't happen unless we know who we are and where we're going and how we get here. When that happens, they all happen more readily. We are a domestic church. All of this comes forth from us. You know, we don't go as spectators to the liturgy. It's not the job of a priest or musician to do mass for you. We have a role to play. So often we're taught slightly in error that Christ is present in the liturgy in four ways, in the sacrament, in the word, in the priest who stands in the person of Christ, in persona Christi, and in the people. But that is a slight misquote. The document actually says, in the praying and singing of the people. So we have a role to fill and a place to be. And we are a pilgrim church. We're we're frail and we're human, and there is nothing perfect this side of heaven. Nothing. No mass you will ever attend on this side of heaven will be perfect. So maybe the most important thing I can say to you, pray for the people who are bringing liturgy to life in your parish. 
support them and pray for them. And if you don't agree with their decisions, pray for them even harder. And let's be open to the Holy Spirit. You know, as Catholics, we believe certain things that are timeless. They have always been true and they will always be true. But we don't believe in a stagnant God. We have a God who calls us always, a spirit that invokes things in us and we are always meant to be listening and following. So with respect, I truly say, if the same five or six people have been planning and executing liturgy at your parish for 12 years, that comes dangerously close to saying, in over a decade, no one with gifts to share and a desire to share them and the prompting of the Holy Spirit to come forward with something new that draws us closer to God, well, you and I know that's not true. Of course they have. But were we listening? Were our ears in tune to the Spirit? And we've got to keep singing and writing songs. You know, even if you believe we should only sing traditional music at Mass, forgive me for saying, but you know, every note ever played, every song ever sung was new once. Henry Wadsworth said, music is for one who loves. Ultimately, I think music at liturgy is our love song to the Lord. And we have been writing those love songs since David wrote a song. And we need to write them until the day Jesus comes again. And it's very possible that the best music for liturgy hasn't even been written yet. And so how do we pull this all together? How do we pull this all together? We put a man on the moon. You thought I forgot. I bet you forgot. Completely forgot, right? So we put a man on the moon. My wife and I, during those first few months of quarantine, we binge watched every show that had anything to do with the Apollo space program. Man's technically NASA's effort to get a man on the moon. We watched every miniseries, every TV show, every documentary. My favorite was a miniseries called From the Earth to the Moon. And in it, I learned we nearly never went. We nearly didn't go. Uh, there was a terrible tragedy early in the Apollo program. Apollo 1 would have been the first manned Apollo mission. But there was a fire in the capsule and all three astronauts perished. If you didn't know this, it could be because it didn't happen up in space. It happened on the ground during a routine test. And not only was it a tragedy, it was a great controversy. The whole program came to a stop for two years. Most people don't remember that. Two years we stopped. There was a congressional hearing where the question at stake really was, is this worth it? Should we even try? And a lot of it hinged upon the testimony of an astronaut. His name was Frank Borman. He did a lot of the research into what happened and investigation. And so when he testified, a lot of his testimony was about the wire that short circuited and there was too much flammable material and the capsule shouldn't have been there. There was a lot of oxygen there. Is that right or wrong? It, very tedious. But at the end of it all, one of the senators said, Mr. Borman, you are not in a court of law. You are free to express your opinion. And what this committee is really trying to get at is what, in your estimation, was the cause of the fire? And Frank Borman said, Senator, the cause of the fire was a failure of imagination. We just never imagined something like this could happen in a test on the ground. We have simulated every possible scenario that we thought could go wrong, but nearly all of them are when we're hundreds of miles from home with no one to help us. It just never occurred to us that something so dangerous and hazardous to the astronauts in the capsule could happen on the launch pad. And so whose fault is it? It's NASA's fault. It's the company that made the wires fault. It's my fault. If I'd have thought of it, my friends, and they were all my friends, would be alive today. So Senator, the failure was one of imagination. Well, I think that is a very apt analogy for liturgy and the church today. It would be so easy for us to say, it would be so easy for us to say, we would love to have a Latin scola at our Easter vigil, but we don't know how to do it. We can't even spell it. You know, we would love for our musicians to greater foster an encounter and be more powerful, but they don't honestly even all get along and they do a lot of different kinds of music. Where would we even start? Listen, if you know where you are and you know where God is calling you to be and you can't think of any way to get there, you're having a failure of imagination, I assure you. And there's more at stake here. In a way, music is just a metaphor for what's going on in the church. Someone asked me recently, do you think when this pandemic is over and we can open the church to 100%, will people come back and will they sing? And I said to him, I know the people that come back will sing, but will people come back? Will they remember who they are? Will they remember that the body of Christ needs each other? 
We were made for each other. And I really think it will be up to us in many ways to do that, not by our own power, only by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit has always given us everything we need and called the body of Christ to be messengers of the encounter. We're called to pray so passionately that it really doesn't matter if the, if the piano player plays the right note or not. We're called to live with such conviction out in this world that people are banging on the doors to get into this church. And how do we go from where we are today to the church where people are banging on the doors to get in? I have no idea. I don't know. We're going to have to figure that out along the way. But let me tell you something. When the Apollo 1 capsule was laid out in 17,000 pieces on a warehouse floor, they did not know when or even if a man would ever set foot on the moon. But I can tell you the end of the story. A man did set foot on the moon because the creative capacity that God has given us was greater than the obstacle before us. And that is true in the church in spades. Our God-given, uniquely human, creative capacity to imagine the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit who does not abandon us, who leads us and guides us and prompts us the love of God for his children, which is you and me and the body of Christ. It is very easy to see how God has not only given us everything we need to get a man to the moon, but to be the church that we are called to be that sings and prays in every generation. Thank you. Thank you.